Fall camp is upon us, including at Minnesota. The Golden Gophers coming off uh, a 9-4 and four campaign under P.J. Fleck. We got Daniel House on the line. You can catch him on Gophers Guru. If you love your NFL coverage as well, Vikings Corner. Daniel, how you doing today? Doing well, Mark. Good to see you. This means college football is back soon, so we can finally uh, start – Quit talking about storylines and get into the actual uh, meat and potatoes of the season here, which is always fun. Big Ten Media Days on the 26th and 7th usher us right into fall camp, including in Minneapolis. And of course, the Gophers play a couple days sooner than most teams with that Thursday night affair against Nebraska as the Big Ten goes with another conference game to open up the season on a Thursday night as they did with Penn State and Purdue last year. Let's start at quarterback. Uh, Tanner Morgan, of course, the longtime starter, uh, 30 touchdowns in his much acclaimed 2019 season. Ethan Calic Humanis, though, got some valuable, valuable playing time in some difficult conditions in Happy Valley, finished off the season after not being counted upon much, but then he explodes for a 319 figure against Wisconsin in the regular season finale. So your your thoughts about uh, Cali Cumanis and, and his progression? Yeah, it's funny you brought up the Penn State game. Nothing like making your first college start uh, in Happy Valley during the whiteout. I remember talking to people in the program that week and they're all going, well, I guess it's going to feel a lot easier when he uh, goes and plays again because he'll never experience an environment like that. The communication and everything that you got to do to play the position first time out there starting, leading the team, all that noise. And it's certainly a beneficial moment for him in his career to get that experience and then play a few games at the end. He started five of the 11 games he appeared in last season and saw those flashes of upside mark where you go tight window throw downfield, vertical pass is able to fit it in there, throw with good anticipation. Uh, the thing I would say that that Minnesota will be challenging him with this year is developing the leadership side of it. Every quarterback experiences that where Tanner was just so dynamic as a leader. And I was around it for a while, so I got to see just how everyone rallied around him. And he was the voice. When he talked, everybody listened. So now Ethan's challenge is to embrace that role, become more vocal as a leader, and then also, the mental processing side of the game, you, you, you can't possibly replicate that until you start playing. I've talked to a lot of quarterbacks saying, you know, even if you've started a few games, it takes time to get used to what defenses are going to do. And I feel like a lot of the teams Minnesota plays this season will be mixing up the coverages, doing a lot of things with the fronts, uh, trying to potentially work Minnesota into mistakes. And Ethan luckily got that experience last year and showed what he can do. Now it's all about harnessing that upside and what does the offense look like mark you have kirk shiraka going to rutgers this offseason the offensive coordinator matt simon and greg harbo will be co-offensive coordinators and we don't exactly know yet who's calling the plays but it would be a collaborative effort they brought in andrew sodder from kent state he was the offensive coordinator there under sean lewis he's the tight ends coach so they have some interesting minds on that side of the ball where they could do some things that suit to the strengths of Ethan Calic Manis. Maybe trying to generate some more yards after the catch. Uh, that's something that I feel is an opportunity to screen game, pairing that up with what they do already in the RPO attack and the play action. So flashes of upside. People are very excited internally about Ethan. And now it's all about those first few games, adjusting, getting used to what it takes to be that voice. I mean, you're coming in the game. And, and you're the guy at quarterback. Now that's the challenge for him is to just embrace that role and get everybody to, to buy in around him. Is Cole Creamer definitely the backup or is there a battle going on there? Uh, Ethan Kelly Manis is the projected starter right now. Cole had a nice spring. He's made a lot of improvements over the course of his career here. Experience knows the offense provides a lot of value in that quarterback room, just from a film study and processing perspective, being able to bounce things off of Ethan and, learned from Tanner Morgan, and he had a nice spring game as well. And the practices that I was at during the open sessions this spring, I thought Cole was making good decisions and, and getting the ball out with accuracy. Very good athlete. Uh, they've used him a bit in that Wildcat package before, so maybe there's some two-quarterback stuff that they can do throughout the season. I don't know if they'll do that. I would say, you know, Ethan, all the upside and traits and the flashes that you see from Ethan – leave everyone excited about uh, what he can do. And 
Now we just got to wait and see how it all comes together. He's got a lot of very good weapons in, in the wide receiver room to work with. Maybe the best that PJ's had in a while since 2019. So we'll, we'll talk about that soon. Yes. You've read my mind. I was going to segue immediately from, from quarterback to wide receiver because it brings back shades of Rashad Bateman, Tyler Johnson, and that crew a few years ago. Uh, Chris Ottman Bell only played three games last year, and Daniel Jackson led the team in receiving from the wide receiver position. And you also mentioned Kirk Shiraka moving on and there being a bit of a mystery of what the approach will be. And you mm -hmm. know better than any that the run approach has been heavy for this squad for the last couple of years. Uh, there was a particular season where they ran the ball more than any uh, team outside of the service academies. Uh, and so now with this uh, group of wide receivers, your thoughts about how they come into play? Yeah, the wide receiver room has a ton of depth and they knew they needed to go into the portal and add some players that complemented who they already had existing in there. Chris Ottman Bell, devastating knee injury right at the start of last season, just a terrible deal. He's coming back for a seventh season. We talked with him last week and he uh, was very thankful for all the support that he received from everyone. He's, he has two degrees from the University of Minnesota, and he said his proudest moment, no matter what he does on the field, is getting those two degrees and seeing the tears in his mom's eyes. So he's got a great story. I hope he has a, a great year. I mean, when before the injury, you, know, you could see that contested catch ability, attacking the football, him continuing to grow as a route runner. He's been working on a lot of different things to take his game to the next level as he continues to get healthy from a, a major injury. So Chris is the veteran voice there, along with Daniel Jackson, who grew immensely last year. I love the growth that we that everyone saw from him this year. Good route runner, quick feet, uh, some nuanced releases that we saw starting to get developed, uh, nice body control and ball skills. I'd say the next step for him is the short area routes, uh, being able to make those blind catches that you sometimes have to make coming out of the break and then creating after the catch, which I think is a goal for all of those receivers. But Jackson certainly benefited from experience. And then, you know, those are the two main guys coming back along with Lamecki Brockington, who had a huge touchdown in the Wisconsin game, showing off some speed in the second level. One of the stronger players in that wide receiver room, uh, players were telling me about him in the weight room and just how much gains he's made since he arrived in the program. Good hands, uh, ability to make adjustments, uh, someone that uh, will be another strong piece uh, in, in the Gophers uh, wide receiver room, along with two transfers they brought in, Mark. I'm extremely intrigued by Elijah Spencer from Charlotte. Very good route runner. And what I like the most is he thrived in man coverage situations. When I watch film, I said, OK, he's getting open against man coverage. Let's explore the numbers. And he averaged 3.6 yards per route run versus man coverage, which was 18th among FBS receivers generated the 10th most first downs versus man coverage among FBS receivers as well. So his ability to get open, that was one thing that I felt Minnesota needed was more skill sets that they could have that put stress on the defense, get open. Uh, then teams can't load the box. They got to decide what they want to do when you're running the football. Do you want to, you know, play zone and have lighter boxes or load the box and play man coverage and maybe get beat on the perimeter last year? Some of these games, they weren't able to, you know, consistently get wide receiver production. Now with Spencer coming in here, uh, being able to do a lot of different things, even in the vertical passing game, he had, I believe, 26 targets on passes of 20 plus yards. And additionally, Corey Crooms, a transfer from Western Michigan, who will be playing in the slot. He's a sudden shifty sort of slot receiver. He had 32 targets on balls of 20 plus yards, which is the sixth highest mark among receivers with at least eight deep targets. To put that into context, Mark, Dalen Wright had nine targets of 20-plus yards. Mike Brown-Stevens had eight, and they were the only receivers last year who posted more than eight targets of 20-plus yards. So to be able to add that vertical dimension to the passing game with the existing players in that room, Crooms and Spencer give them a different type of skill set. They're, they're differing in terms of like Elijah Spencer is more of the physical receiver who can move the chains like the – ability for him to drop his weight in and out of breaks and get open. And then Crooms is more of the shifty player that you can do a lot of different things with jet sweeps, orbit motions, get the ball to him in space, put him in the slot, and let him win with his suddenness at the top of route. So 
I like those those two additions along with the players that I mentioned. Christian Hoskins is coming back as well. He's a freshman who's been getting stronger in the weight room, more of a gadget type of player who you could maybe put some packages together for. Uh, I know Minnesota is very excited about wide receiver and then a tight end as well. Brevin Span Ford coming back. Folks, we got two things for you to do here to support the channel. Please hit the like button and subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football. Get on over to Gophers Guru and also Vikings Corner if you love the NFL to check out Daniel's work right there. And uh, Daniel, just let us know uh, what people are going to find there in particular at uh, Gophers Guru. You'll find a lot of different types of content, studies, looking at some of the trends that I found with Minnesota football and in the college level across the FBS. Uh, spent a lot of time looking at passing downs defense this offseason. Some of my studies that I've been doing off to the side that I'll probably be putting out as the season gets closer. Uh, keep an eye out for those. And then I have features with the players. I interviewed about 16 different players last week. So I've been putting out some features on that. So it's a next-gen approach, Mark, where we kind of blend the – football schematic side of it with the numbers in a way that people can understand it, give them something to, to look at during the game to maybe think about it differently than they would. And then also providing a, a way for players to share their stories. That's what I love is being able to find these guys who have unique backgrounds that have maybe overcome adversity or stepped up into larger roles. Uh, that's the fun part for me is to be able to just provide comprehensive coverage like that. What, of course, was unique uh, two seasons ago was to see in one of the more as astounding situations to this day is to see Mo Ibrahim go down and then back number two and back number three and back number four. And they got to a fifth back and they were still churning out 100 yeah. yard individual rushing games. So that speaks to the offensive line as well. The depth at running back. But two of those guys, of course, Mo Ibrahim, one of the most prolific backs in the history of the conference and Trey Potts, who again showed that he could uh, carry the mail on a regular basis. Both of them are gone from this unit. Yeah, uh, Mo Ibrahim's with the Lions, signed an undrafted rookie contract, go down as one of the greats in Gopher football history. One of the most, uh, I mean, special backs that I've watched uh, in the time that I've been around Minnesota football, just the, the complete package. So replacing that along with leaders like Tanner Morgan, John Michael Schmitz at the center spot, creates a new challenge because those guys were very unique in their approach and they've taught and developed up a lot of these players that are waiting for their chance now. So we're seeing those guys start to make their mark. You mentioned Trey Potts transferring to Penn state, Minnesota addressed this by bringing in Sean Tyler from Western Michigan, a slashing type of back. The, the number that stood out to me uh, after watching film and exploring more, he had the fifth best breakaway run percentage among FBS backs with, at least 172 attempts last year per PFF. So he has that breakaway playability when he gets into the second and third level, gives you some value as a receiver as well, a smaller back that's got uh, the ability to, to potentially, you know, get screens in space, uh, swing passes, those type of things, while also giving you that slashing dimension that you're looking for in Minnesota zone blocking scheme. And I'm very uh, hyped up about Zach Evans. He is entering his second season here with the Gophers. High school player out of Texas, played at 6A football in Texas. So he's seasoned. He came in here. He adjusted very fast. He got stronger this offseason. And the trait that I like the most about his game, Mark, is the ability to make people miss in the second and third level. He's got that little bit of shake. You saw it in the spring game at a couple big runs. Uh the acceleration in the second and the third level, and then the sharp cutbacks, which are perfect for that outside zone scheme where you're putting your foot in the ground, one cut and go. Uh, Zach Evans has a chance to be a very, very good back for Minnesota. And then you have Bryce Williams, who's returning as the veteran, very experienced uh, type of runner who you know will grind out yardage for you and, and also has receiving ability as well. So his presence is huge as they undergo a big change there. Along with Darius Taylor, who's a true freshman, prized get in this recruiting class, had a ton of high-profile offers. Minnesota managed to fend off a lot of NIL money from other schools because Darius just liked what the program had to offer. You look at the backs, you've said it, their ability to develop those backs is something that helps them on the recruiting trail. And the big, the big thing to watch this year is Nick McKissick, Luke's taken over at running backs coach. Kenny Burns was the running backs coach for a very long time under PJ Fleck. He just took the head job at Kent State. Congrats, Kenny. He's a great guy. Uh, 
pivotal part of Minnesota's success. So watch Nick McKissick, Luke uh, coming in here, developing backs and see how his approach maybe differs and, and has some similarities to, to what Kenny did. Talking Gophers with Daniel House. You can catch him on Gophers Guru, of course, and Vikings Corner if you love the NFL as well. We're breaking down at Minnesota football headed toward fall camp. Offensive line has been a pillar of this offense. They've leaned heavily on these guys. Michael Schmitz, one of the best in the business. He moves on. Uh, they only bring back 40 career starts among this offensive line that has to be revamped. Yeah, the offensive line, John Michael Schmitz, the centerpiece. I mean, you look at his ability to you know, finish blocks to the whistle, drive players off the ball, reach block, his quickness. Uh, he's going to start week one for the New York Giants, who's picked in the second round. We'll go down as one of the best centers that, that Minnesota's had overall. Replacing that will be a challenge, but – Nathan Bowe is likely going to step into that role. He's been watching and learning behind John Michael Schmitz. He's entering his sixth year here in Minnesota. So he's got a great knowledge of what Minnesota is doing schematically along the offensive line. I just posted a feature that's open for everybody on the website with Nathan Bowe talking about his approach, uh, toughness, his mental makeup, how he approaches the game and the way that he's going to carry the torch forward that many centers and off interior offensive linemen at Minnesota have established. So keep an eye on Bo. He can play guard as well. Carter Shaw and Bo both have guard center flexibility. So Minnesota will explore combinations throughout camp and figure out which one is best and then plug that player in. Uh, the interior is where the question marks are. Uh, Mark, you got Tyler Cooper, Carter Shaw, Nathan Bo competing for the center and left guard spots. They are planning on kicking Quinn Carroll inside. It looks like to right guard from right tackle. He played there on the outside last year. I felt like maybe this would be a good transition for his skill sets, being able to handle the, you know, the bigger physicality of defensive tackles versus the quickness on the edge. So he's kicking inside and then they'll try to figure out who the right tackle is between Martez Lewis and JJ Gaudet. That will be a intriguing battle throughout camp who emerges for that. But on the left side, Mark, you got another player who has a tremendous amount of upside that hasn't even scratched the surface of what he can become in Ariante Ursary. Extremely athletic, uh, flexibility, improved his technique last year, can even get better in that area. Talked with Brian Callan, the offensive line coach, and he said he's learning the details of what it takes to become a pro, and he can be the next great one for Minnesota. Uh, last year saw the flashes. Now another big jump forward from him is expected. I also am keeping an eye on a couple of young players in the interior. Greg Johnson's a true freshman. It's hard to play football as a true freshman in the Big Ten, especially along the offensive line. But Greg Johnson, from what I've heard, has adjusted very well. It doesn't surprise me. He's a player that flashed on the camp circuit, local product at a, a prior lake. Keep an eye on him along with Ashton Beers, a player they picked up in a previous class from Slinger, Wisconsin. Uh, someone who can also help in the interior provide depth. And they're going to let this thing play out. They are going to compete, uh, mix up combinations throughout training camp and determine what's best. I do believe they have a lot of quality options there. And those players have been working together. They know each other. They have pretty good chemistry. So that transition will probably go smoother than some teams who would be experiencing that type of turnover along their offensive line.